Good evening, everyone. Today, I have the great pleasure of hosting an informal, uh, hopefully fun discussion on free speech and cancel culture. Joining me today are Caleb, who is a third year university student at the University of Victoria, studying political science. He is an immigrant from Eritrea, who grew up in Victoria, BC, Canada. Lillian Crossman is a student studying biology at the University of British Columbia and the current president of the UBC Students for Freedom of Expression Club. She has been a longtime champion of academic freedom on campus and off campus, and she enjoys studying amphibians in her spare time. Renata Siekman is a mother of four, an Academy Award nominated documentary producer, and she has worked in business startups her entire career after having earned a bachelor's degree in science at the University of British Columbia with a specialty in medical genetics. Renata is originally from Germany, having moved to Canada in her high school years. So welcome to the show, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just kick it off and uh, with uh, the first topic here, the question is, do we currently have free speech in Canada? And under this question, uh, we could talk about as you've seen before, what I sent out previously, I sent to all three guests here tonight just some bullet points. We can discuss the legislation legislation in Canada that protects or hinders free speech. Uh, are there limits to free speech? Should there be limits to free speech? What should those limits be, if any? And is free speech alive and well in Canada today? Take it away. Well, uh, I guess I'll pick up start just to make this easy, <laughs> look at it from the, the general perspective, I would say yes. In the general perspective, Canada, we do have free speech because um, first and foremost, we do have a charter of rights and freedoms, which state that we do have free speech. It states that we have the freedom to believe what we want. And just that acknowledgement alone is something that we often take for granted. Like for example, Adrian stated that I'm from Eritrea and in that country, they don't even have a constitution because it makes it easier for the dictator, the state head, to allow himself to do whatever he wants to the people who run the country. And the fact that we get to live in a country that allows us to at least acknowledge that we can say what we want gives a general perspective of freedom of speech. I, in theory, I agree with you. And um, if you had asked me six months ago, I would have agreed with you wholeheartedly. I don't anymore. And I'll tell you why. And there are two things. You brought up the um, Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which I take very seriously and certainly as an immigrant. Um, and free speech, and I looked this up earlier, so I'm referring to my notes here because I like to be accurate. <laughs> so it's protected, free, freedom of expression is protected as a fundamental freedom by section two of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which sounds great. However, and there is a caveat that the charter permits government to enforce reasonable limits. But these section reasonable one, limits, Denia. pardon me? <laughs> yeah, the section one will always get you. Right, exactly. So that essentially gives the government the power to do whatever the heck they want, because yeah. reasonable, what is reasonable? I, I, I can't even begin to guess what that might be. And in my opinion, and we can talk about that more later, um, our freedom of expression and our freedom of speech is under serious attack by our current administration. And that is a huge problem. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you there. I think that like relative to other countries, Canada does have pretty robust freedom of expression, um, but that could always change because it's so subject on the current government and the current court system. It's not just freedom of expression, like any of our freedoms can be overridden by that section one of the charter that uh, says that you have to have reasonable limits on these freedoms. So like you're seeing it with the government now with COVID and it's so easy for just like the Overton window can shift either way and the government can just restrict all of your freedoms under that section one. I think that that makes our charter very weak. Um, university campuses is something that a lot of people don't know. Um, it only applies in very specific instances. Like um, there was one case, I think it was in Alberta, where it did 
apply because what happened was professors on Facebook and a bunch of other students agreed. Um, and the professor demanded that the university take action against this student um, and punish her under non-academic misconduct. And so the student was uh, suspended from school for a period of time and it obviously uh, messed up her academic career. And then she was able to sue uh, stating a violation of her charter rights. And she did win because in giving somebody an education, the university is acting as the government because that is their government purpose and why they receive funding from the punitive measure uh, restricts somebody from receiving education for the reason of something that they said. But for example, like universities canceling speakers or disallowing speakers, that is totally allowed under the charter because uh, in that case, the university is acting as a private. So we have to remember that the charter only applies in these very specific instances when it's not, when it can't be overwritten by section one because it's within reasonable limits. And when it's explicitly a government entity. Um, so I think that universities obviously need to have a robust policy for uh, freedom of expression and academic freedom, but the charter doesn't help us there. You know, that's so interesting what you're saying there. Um, I'm not sure that universities really should regulate uh, freedom of speech. Oh, they and, shouldn't, no. Right? Yeah, yeah. They, sh they shouldn't at all, because in my opinion, they, at the universities, we're educating our brightest, you know, our future uh, business leaders, our future political leaders, our future educational leaders. And leaders are never ever followers. So if you're crushing the spirit of trying to be a trailblazer, are you not really creating followers rather than leaders? And leaders should never be afraid of coming out with an outrageous idea or, or articulating, you know, profound new whatever, because that's what drives us forward, right, mm -hmm. as a country. Um, and what I'm referring to, I've recently spoken to a student at the business school at UBC, and so, you know, I was very politically active and everything. And I, I and he, um, we basically, he agreed with a lot of my, my thoughts. And so he said, oh, there are many other students in the business school who agree as well. And I said, well, can you bring some of the students together? And I'm happy to go and speak to them. And he goes, no, I can't. I'm afraid what? because, yeah, I'm afraid because there might be repercussions by the professors, by fellow yeah. students and potentially future employers. I was floored. I was floored. Yeah, I have that same problem when I try to get people to uh, join my club. Like, they completely agree with me. They agree with everything our club stands for. But they can't bear to jeopardize their future careers, especially people who want to go into academia. They won't even touch the club because it's just like a death sentence for that those kind of careers. So here's my question. Why is it a death sentence? Is, is there a particular culture on Canadian university campuses that makes folks feel that they would there would be repercussions if they were to join a free speech society or attend a talk organized by a PPC candidate? Caleb, do you want to do you want to get that one first since you haven't spoken in a bit? I, I also wanted to just conclude on something we were, you guys were just talking about. I also think it's important what you guys said. I would just um, elaborately speaking on the fact that we have a place where we can have a discussion like this. That's what I was saying to the extent of free speech that we have, where in some countries it is so extreme that they don't. But you guys are completely right, which brings into Adrian's question. Um, no, there's definitely that kind of fear, because especially for someone like me who's a political science student, it's political suicide. Yeah. For the common term. like. Um, but why? Why? Is why? It because... For example, uh, one of the biggest and most recent um, politically active movements was Black Lives Matter. Something that is very important to me, the, the idea that Black people are being persecuted by police officers and other forces of government for the way they look, is, it's, a, it's a horrible thing. But 
I have to acknowledge that there is a conversation to be held there. There are some people who do not believe in Black Lives Matter. Okay, why? I want to hear you. Just because we're not agreeing on the same side. For example, me and Renate might not agree on a lot of things. I'm, I've been more on a liberal NDP side of government. She's on the PPPC side. But we're here talking. We're having a simple conversation. That's what free speech is about. And on campus, um, whatever the social norm is, that's what has to be accepted. For example, when I'm in school, sometimes kids will talk to me as if I've, I'm a subject to pity. Like they want to be applied almost as if simply based off the fact that they're Caucasian, uh, they owe me a debt. And that whatever I say goes almost like I dictate their life from here on out because historically Caucasians have dictated the lives of black people. But then that's just a reverse order of what happened. That does not make any sense. And sure, it does not mean that I don't believe that there are some retributions to be paid in some aspects, but definitely a conversation needs to be held to understand where to go from here on out. And if we don't have these kind of conversations, that's virtually impossible. Yeah, I feel like the university problem is kind of complex. Like it's, it's the new people getting in, like a lot of them have gotten in through things like affirmative action, like they're letting in a lot more women. Um, they're letting in a lot more um, people because of their identities. And then a lot of people have been forced out because academia has become so liberal that they've just thrown up their hands and resigned. And then so it's just kind of snowballed into academia being this like extremely left wing space and it's become sort of a cult of virtue almost like if you want freedom of expression it's because you must have some hateful idea that you want to spew and you don't care about the feelings of like minorities or whoever who, who might have who might be offended by these things and like i i can agree with caleb like these things should definitely be discussed uh I, I'm not a minority myself, like, I guess I'm a woman, but that's not really a minority. But if somebody treated me the way that people, that Caleb says that people treat them, I think I would feel uncomfortable. Um, and I don't think that minorities have ever been asked to be babied. I, I think that's kind of a disrespect towards them to say that, like, they can't, like, people can't handle civil discourse about these issues, and that we need to protect them. And I don't think universities are the space to be doing that like universities of any place should be a place for open conversation well I like within to... reason things need to be credible but here, yeah you want to jump in yeah it's, uh, it's funny when you think about it because in university we learn about um different historical periods about in, at least in my faculty about philosophers such as Niccolo Machiavelli, Karl Marx and these people purposely say very radical things to some people. And it's funny that in times that were centuries before us, these radical thoughts were openly expressed, but for someone to say something not even as half as radical, just to speak on it, even though we're learning about these topics, it's almost looked at as wrong. I think that's just one way of looking at it. You could say in a school today, oh, Karl Marx had some good points. Potentially, that's because he's a very left-wing thinker. But what you cannot say is, for example, someone said in my class, um, one good thing that Adolf Hitler did was expand the car industry in such ways of BMW, Mercedes, and Volkswagen. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I'm in front so, of that. So that's politically incorrect to say that. Is that what it is? Well, yeah, he, he yeah. Considered the most evil person ever. You can't well, say that you like his environmental policies, even. Well, of course. <laughs> But, you know, I'm really curious, is there actually a book where all the politically incorrect statements are listed? So those it's of us who may not know this, exactly. It's changed by the hour. I'll be criticized by some of my friends for just saying that point right now, but it's, it's something exactly. that needs to be addressed. Yeah, it, it does. But I think we've taken it too far. I mean, at what point are you constantly afraid? Oh, my God, I better not touch this one. Oh, I better not say that. Right. It's we've taken it, I think, or society has taken it to a, an extreme or maybe it's really starting in the universities and in the school, you know, earlier uh, education years. 
Um, but I just wanted to address a couple of points that you had made, Lillian. And, and one of them is when you said um, that now a lot of students are brought on from, from minorities, like for example, more women. And all I can say to that is, you know what, if I had ever been hired because I'm a woman or I would have been brought into a university because I'm a woman, I would have been appalled. No, I want to kick ass and I want to be the best that I can yeah. be. It's right? insulting. Of course. <laughs> so that spirit that? is crushed now, isn't it? I, I think that like scholarships and things like that that's like free reign because people are handing out these scholarships. If you want to give a scholarship to Indonesian women to pursue women's studies, like go for it. But I don't think that the standards for admission to any program should be lowered because of somebody's identity or like how they were born. That I think that kind of makes them, it's insulting and it just makes people like that seem uncredible. Like, if you had a professor and you suspected they might be hired because of affirmative action, I think that would make you respect them less. Yeah, of course, no question. question and actually, credibility. pardon me? You'd essentially just have to question their credibility at that point because yeah. what, who oh, are well. they and why are they responsible or even allowed to be in this position? But yeah. you would get in trouble for doing that. 100%. Yeah, it's very interesting. Well, I came here in grade nine and uh, I didn't speak any English, but you know, it really motivated me to work harder because when you don't speak the language, people automatically assume your elevator isn't going all the way to the top <laughs> just because you don't have all the words, right? Or many words. Um, but anyway, so I work, you know, twice as hard as anybody else. And at the end of grade 12, I, I actually won the award as the girl with the highest grades in sciences, which wow. really made, made me proud, right? But now looking back, I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder where did I place with regards to the guys, you know? It was just girls only. And of course, now they don't, they don't award that anymore because it's too uh, sexist, I guess, for lack of another <laughs> word. <laughs> so it's so interesting how, how times have changed, but I don't think for the better, I think it's making us weaker as people rather than stronger. And it's a tough world out there and it's a very tough uh, com com competition out in the world. And one thing I noticed with my kids, for example, that when they were playing baseball and soccer, my kids are all adults now, but when they were playing baseball and soccer, they started giving awards for participation. I was outraged. Like, what the heck is that? You know, wherever, when in the, in the big world, in the business world, do we get an award for showing up? Never. But it's not the kids that initiated that, though. It's the parents. Yeah. Every no, kid feels getting that yeah. award. Too. Yeah, of course. So essentially, uh, to your point, Lillian, it almost sounds to me like, you know, you just kind of show up and because you're a woman or because you're whatever the university is trying to fill that slot, well, you're in. And that's yeah. it. So I remember it. Back in like 2015, 2016, like feminism was a big thing. So like in, in these sorts of conversations, I could kind of say a bit more because I had some like oppression points because I was I was girl. But now like you don't get any oppression points for being a white woman anymore. Like you have to have like an, another tier. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I just find it kind of funny how quickly things change. Yeah, yeah, they do. And talking about change, I mean, there are a couple bills that the government is trying to pass, which to me personally are of huge concern. And you're probably familiar with them, right? Bill C-10 in particular, which already mm -hmm. passed in the House of Commons at 1.30 in the morning via phone vote, which I find sort of suspect. And if that becomes law, it would allow the government to censor what we can read on the internet. Well, I find that appalling. It's appalling isn't it? Now, yeah. let's just, sorry, if I can just interject for two seconds for the benefit of the audience, uh, I just, um, what's, can we give an objective sort of um, uh, portrayal of Bill C-10? I watched some YouTube videos yesterday to get an understanding. I haven't read through Bill C-10. I'll include a link in the video description and I do encourage everyone to look it up. Um, but what is Bill C-10 and what's the purpose behind it? You guys are more political, so it's 
Well, probably do a better job. I, I, I can't take more political credit than Renata here, so I'll let her take the room. Oh, <laughs> no, that's all right. No, it's essentially a censorship bill. It, it's a direct attack on our freedom of speech, and it will, will allow the government to censor what we can read or not on the internet. I don't know what else I, needs to be said about it. I think that its intention is to promote Canadian content, if I'm not mistaken. I think you're right, but I think it's it's a cu- an excuse to just I, make I it more, more palatable and more, oh, you know, we're going to give the Canadians the advantage. No, I think at the well, end of the day... That if the government was more trustworthy... Um, it might work. Like, I think that what they do with the radio, where you have to have a certain percentage of Canadian artists being played, I, I think that's actually a good thing because it promotes the Canadian music industry. Sure. Um, but, yeah, the internet and, like, freedom of expression online has just been, like, so extremely politicized that it's... I, I think that those are the intentions. It's just to censor people online. I think one point in relation to what we talked about before, Section 1 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, that sort of talks about reasonable limits on those rights and sort of leaves it very open. It's very open, so it's very subjective. And so whatever the government is at the time or the cultural narrative at the time, you know, it could go either way. I think one of the concerns that folks might have with Bill C-10 is it is fairly open. So it's at the CRTC's discretion as to what is maybe inappropriate content or or something like that. So maybe that's one of the fears that folks have. Well, I'll jump in there. Um, I think that's a problem with any law. Forget, forget the topic we're talking about. Any law, bill, whatsoever you want to call it, should not be open. Because theoretically, just like a lot of these bills are based theoretically, someone can come into a power, whether you believe that's the person right now or the person in the past or a person in the future, that can radically change these bills. And they can change them either for the better or for the worse. But we as citizens are not here to stand for uh, a chance, per se. Um, we can't allow things like that to be so open that they can be taken for uh, perception or for your interpretation of these things. It, it, it needs to be more straightforward in the sense that whatever you are trying to promote or prohibit needs to be directly focused and just simply put. It's a challenge, though, I think, too, because Bill C-10 and Bill C-16 and Bill C-36 and these ones that are have been coming out recently, um, I think, are more from the, the Liberal Party. So let's say you're not a Liberal uh, and you don't f- believe in that ideology. Um, here is a party that's sort of, I guess, sort of setting the course for, uh, s- s- you know, uh, uh, related to free speech in, in Canada. And, um, you know, if they have, you know, it's control of the House of Commons and the Senate, uh, then, you know, these things will get passed through. So even though the Charter of Rights and Freedoms might explicitly state that Canadians should have freedom of speech and freedom of expression, these other bills can sort of come out and override it. Yeah, and it's a really slippery slope, isn't it? You know, once you open the door that you give the government the current administration that kind of power to what end you know to what end because it's usually like one little step at a time and then they just grab more uh control and more control and i one of the reasons why i came to this country is because i i love uh the democracy i love the freedoms um and they're all being taken away so that doesn't really work for me very well you know it's, it's scary to me um, for sure. Um, but even more scary than, well, Bill C-10 is concerning, but Bill, to me personally, Bill C-36 is is completely scary. Um, yeah. So I don't know how many, how much detail you know about Bill C-36. Lillian? Sorry? Lil- Lillian, did you want to take that one or? or uh, was that the prostitution one? Uh, no, this one is actually an act, and I have my notes here too, an act to amend the Criminal Code and Canadian Human Rights Act. So essentially, it would allow for an anonymous accuser to accuse you or me or whoever of hate speech, whatever that definition is, um, and uh, yeah, accuse you anonymously uh, and also of that they are afraid of you. So 
I mean, anybody can say they're afraid of you for making a statement that they don't agree with, I suppose. But here's the kicker. So uh, it includes fear of, of hate, propaganda, or hate crime. And the right. potential punishment for this is a potential prison term, house arrest, wearing, having to wear a, a monitoring device, a $50,000 fine. I mean, this is just nightmare material, in my opinion. Well, and it is also unconstitutional. The Charter has very clear rules about what is actually considered hate speech. For something to be willful promotion of hatred, I believe that it has to, you can't, if you just like are screaming hateful things out into the street, that doesn't count. Like the most, the most famous case of this is, uh, it was Keekstra uh, and he was a high school, or high school or elementary school teacher. And for like eight years, he was uh, talking about how Jews were evil and like general like Holocaust denial because he was deemed to be somebody who had a certain amount of power because he had influence over these kids and because he was doing it consistently and acting like he was speaking the truth over a number of years that counted as willful promotion of hatred. Bill C-36, which sorry I, I get them mixed up it seems like there's a new anti-free speech bill like every week. Um, it, it just the scope of what is considered hate under this bill is just completely blowing that out of the water. Like Canada's hate speech laws, while they're not as as good as the U.S. in that, like you can be punished more for what you say because of Section One. Like this would not fly in the Charter, um, and I, I think that if they do pass this and if they actually try to implement it, there will be some uh, arguments against it based on the Charter. But I don't. I don't know, because it's the internet. Yeah, I don't know, because it doesn't count as like a government entity. I'm not sure. I'm not a law student. I don't know if that would apply here. But yeah, I agree. It's it's very scary. I have a quick question for both of you, since I know we don't have too much time here. But I think we can talk about these topics forever, like specifically bill by bill. But the key concept is, why are we so sensitive to things in this generation? So much so that hasn't been seen before. Why do you get, what do you guys think is the key root cause in your opinion from your uh, experience that you see that's allowing us as a society to be okay generally with this radical change or what you may feel is a radical change, I should say. Yeah, can I, can I start? Okay, well, I think that it's a combination of things because it's kind of like, it's been going on for a long time but millennials kind of spearheaded this whole social justice thing. And I think a big part of it is just that they're bitter. They are not doing well economically. Um, like so many of them have all this student debt and they're not going anywhere in their careers because the economy is tanked. I think they need some something or somebody to blame it on. If they can scapegoat these kinds of things like, systemic racism, misogyny, various forms of oppression, then they don't have to deal with the realities of the situations that they're in. And another part of it is because like, it's not just the people that it benefits who are, who are trying to promote these things. Like I see the most, <laughs> the most passionate Black Lives Matter activists I see are white women. And I have like some theories about this, but I'm not, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think that a big part of it, like women, especially, um, this might be controversial to say, but I think women really need to feel like they belong and like they're part of a group and women are generally more followers rather than leaders when compared to men. Um, and it's just like, as this has all built, if you're not in favor of these kind of rules and this social justice narrative you're kind of left out like i don't know how many times where i have like made a friend in class and then i mentioned that i was part of the students for freedom of expression club and then they've just like kind of like not wanted anything to do with me mm -hmm. Being part of these kind of social justice communities and like 
gay communities or anything like that. It just still gives people a sense of belonging. I think that like everybody wants to belong. Everybody wants to feel special. Everybody wants somebody else to blame. Um, and they want to feel virtuous. That's a big thing as well. Um, and so it's just kind of all compounded on top of each other. That's, you know, that's, that's really interesting. Thing. Yeah, those are really interesting points you're raising. Uh, I also believe it really uh, started with the whole creation of social media and the ability to attack people anonymously, right? I mean, we didn't have that before. And, and it's a completely different thing, I would think, to, to have the courage to go to someone and say, oh, you know what, I really don't agree with you, and blah, 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 blah. Well, you would never, ever say the hurtful things in person, at least a normal person wouldn't do that. But somehow, you know, hiding behind their computer and hiding behind some anonymous name, whatever, all of a sudden they feel entitled to just rip other people people to shreds so that's really not okay so if there is any rule that the government should do if they could i don't know is take away the ability to for people to talk anonymously you know put it on the table and then let's talk about it because that way you have a possibility to resolve issues whereas if you're attacked by an anonymous person well what are you going to do with that right well, I think if we combine those two thoughts, because I think generally those are the two major aspects that play a role in this situation, like this issue, I should say. Um, to go back to Lillian's point, I think you have a good point when you were talking about the white women and the Black Lives Matter. Um, it doesn't only apply to Black Lives Matter, it applies to a lot of these issues. People see other people fighting, other uh, marginal groups, we could say, fighting like black, lives, black people fighting for their civil rights in the 60s, 70s, even you could say today. The issue is other people think that fight is something exciting, something revolutionary, something good, which it is, but they wanna be part of it so much so that they start making a false narrative in their head that they felt the pain that those people went through. And they start fighting to a point that goes beyond the actual oppressed people like in Port, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. In Oregon, I don't know if you've heard about the Antifa blockades. Yeah. I think Chats. they did a poll where it was like 97% of the people inside those blockades are white. <laughs> in a Black Lives Matter protest, the leader of that blockade is white. It doesn't even logically make sense. And social media, which has its benefits, allows these things to sometimes to grow out of proportion because everyone can join in on the conversation without having credible say. Uh, you can say whatever you want without anyone knowing it's really you. Mm -hmm. or just like you said, Renata. And uh, those two points together, I think are really important in that topic, for sure. So I'm yeah. glad you can raise this. Right, but then you do have power. I mean, I've been attacked a lot on social media, but when somebody does that, either I block them right away, so at least we have that option, or I engage a little bit to see if we can somehow have a conversation. But if they become personally insulting, I just say, you know what, I don't engage with people who can't have a rational uh, discussion. And so I will block you now. Goodbye. So they know why, right? Um, so we do have that power, thankfully. True. Well, and I'm loving this discussion. So thank you so much, everybody, for being honest and open. I so appreciate it. And I think the audience does as well, because this is what we need more of in Canada. I think this is sort of a, a resistance to um, quashing of free speech and, you know, just honest, reasonable, civil discussions between people with, you know, on a, an on array of, of, of issues. And um, where was I going with this? Uh, the, one of the things, you know, so I guess Renata, as a, as a guest on this episode in particular, you know, I think some folks watching will recall the, if I, if, if I may raise the, uh, the controversy of your campaign with the flyers. Um, and, and I found it interesting when I spoke with you that there was a different nuance to it that I didn't understand from reading sort of the CBC article that I'd read about it initially. And the fact that uh, the chief of the Musqueam uh, Nation, uh, Chief Wayne Sparrow, I believe was his name, he actually had turned down a request 
uh, with you to have a conversation about the flyers and see this. And I'll let you speak to that in a second, but just to speak to Caleb's point, uh, I think, and, and everybody's point is, you know, Renata, you mentioned social media, Lillian, you mentioned millennials and sort of how, uh, they've sort of uh, latched on to some of these issues and then you have social media and it's just created this almost perfect storm. Uh, so you can have anonymous comments and all these one-liners, but nobody actually wants to engage in a, in a reasonable discussion about it. And this kills me because there's so many times where I see stuff on Facebook and I chime in and I say, Hey, would you like to come on and have a dialogue about this? You know, rather than just saying like, you know, um, this group of people or that group of people or these one-liners like, like, you know, uh, you know, the band of Trump followers or, you know, Biden folks or whatever, and, and the, you know, libtards or whatever phrases and stuff we're throwing around. It's just these one-liners on social media and nobody actually wants to sit down and have an honest dialogue. So where does that leave us as a society? If we're just a, you know, a bunch of one-liners on social media, like we don't have enough discussions like this. I think that's a huge problem. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with you, actually. And that's, I find a big problem, especially in the younger uh, generation, meaning the children now that the five year olds are already in front of, you know, an, an iPad, uh, the 10 year olds, they, they play computer games, and they don't engage anymore with with children or adults, and the adults don't engage with the children, how are they going to learn? How will they learn how you have a discussion? Very important. Well, Very we model important. that behavior, right? Parents in the older generation are modeling, supposed to model that behavior. And all I mm -hmm. see is, and I think the pandemic has also added to that perfect storm where you have a lot of people who are at home or just on their phones. We had the social isolation and the social distancing. So we're all apart together, but apart. And so we're all on our phones or on Facebook and we're just, you know, reading the news, following the election, chiming in you know, liking something or throwing an, an angry emoji on it, but like nobody's actually having honest, fair, open, reasonable discussions. Like we're all human beings at the end of the day. And this is what I cannot stress enough. And that's why it's so important. And simply for having you on this show and doing an episode with you, Renata, I can't imagine, you know, there could be the odd, you know, silly comment on the thread here without them even listening to what you have to say. And it doesn't mean they have to agree with you. Just listen to what you have to say and where you're coming from, right? So anyway, that's... So you, I would like to speak to that briefly. I know this conversation isn't about <laughs> my campaign per se, the free speech um, but it was... The flyers. Pardon me? I, sorry, I just, I feel like the flyer does relate... The flyers, to the right. Are you talking about the ones that say, like, discrimination is wrong and it has the residential yeah. school? Yeah. yeah, I got one of those. Right. And discrimination is wrong. It is wrong. I mean, I what's personally there? thought it was a little bit bad optics, just considering like the current political climate. Um, but I'd like to hear your justification. Sure. Well, hindsight is always 2020, right? So it was meant as certainly an attention getter. It was not meant to get me a win in politics. There was no way I was going to win in this ride. Yeah, you weren't expecting <laughs> right? There was no chance of that whatsoever. But it was really to get people's attention. And what was missing on the postcard, and we should have made that more clear. Um, but like I said, hindsight is 2020. But there was a pass uh, that was implemented or put onto the indigenous population in the 1880s which for they couldn't leave their reservation without this pass and it was hard for them to get this pass so they had to, to they had to have the pass to get to to go and visit their children in the schools or to visit a relative on the neighboring reservation to take their wares to the market and there's the parallel with the past now. It's, it's discrimination. It, I'm talking about the vaccine passport. It's discrimination, it's segregation. And so we had it in Canada before and the past that was, was implemented for the indigenous people lasted for 50 years. 50 years and that in my opinion is what the chief should have talked about because what i've realized since then i sort of thought canadians would know their history but canadians don't and i have since talked to countless 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 people and educated them about the past system that we've had here in canada in the past and 99 percent of the people say oh i didn't know that well 
that's that's where I was going with this. So yes, discrimination is wrong and segregation is wrong, and I will stand by that forever. And I was disappointed that the chief, I wrote him a really nice long email explaining where I was coming from. And a lot of people actually did get it. I mean, in defense of, of <laughs> Canadians who know their history, they did get it. And they responded to me and said, you know what, I'm glad you bring that up. But then, of course, there were the haters who were, oh, vicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was disappointed that a the chief uh, did not take me up on the up on the um, uh, my invitation for a conversation, and b that he missed this opportunity to bring it up himself, and also bring up the fact that wait a second, and we still have reservations with no clean water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are important points. But my position is always, okay, we've looked at the past, that's important. But if we keep staring at the past, we have our back turned to the future, right? What can we do today to make it better? Where are we going with this? That's a discussion that needs to be had and no one, no one is having it, you know, because they're so busy staring at the past and being upset about the past. And just lastly, the people that were the worst haters were absolutely not the ones affected. And here again, we're talking about these, these social, uh, what do you call it? Well, you had a good word for them. They, they just feel responsible. Social justice warriors? <laughs> Pardon me? The social justice warriors? Yes, and they feel like personally insulted and attacked, whereas it had nothing to do with them, nothing. So it was a very interesting experience, <laughs> for sure. Can well, I just jump one... in really quickly? Yeah, Can of I... course, Caleb, please. Okay, um, I get your point, Rene, and I think this is a place where we might disagree a little bit. I completely agree with you on free speech and the fundamental topic. But right here, I think um, the mistake that you and your party have made was not talking about discrimination as being bad. If you're a decent human being, you know that. Um, your opinion on the vaccine passports, uh, we can get into that forever, but everyone has varying opinions. So it, that's one thing. But the mistake is, it's the fundamental mistake, fundamental mistake that you made was with vaccine passports, that affects us as Canadians, as a people, as a country, as an institution. The residential schools affects a people for who they were, a, a certain group of people only based on who they were. The vaccine is a larger topic. So I understand where the approach was coming, trying to bring attention to the vaccine passports, but sometimes bringing a business flyer style you know, grabber or hook by using something so controversial and using it in a situation that is so heartfelt, emotional, saddening, and just evil, especially when it has to do with people that sometimes we have no right to talk about how that would have been equal to feel like, or I'm not saying that we don't have a right to talk about it, but we wouldn't understand that feeling. It's, it, that's where the line I think was crossed for a lot of people. And I'm not even trying to say to you that you are wrong, but one, I don't think it was a smart move. And two, I don't think it was, in my opinion, fundamentally right for that reason. Okay. <laughs> I just, no, I, I think, no, I, I hear you totally. I hear you totally. I hear you totally. But you know, you make decisions at some point and, and then you go with it, right? No, I, 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 get, I get that. I was just the reason I brought that in because I know a lot of people feel that way. And I know a lot of people express that feeling in a way they shouldn't, which is what you were saying, people hating on you because they think you're hating. I don't think you were hating. I just think you went the wrong way about it for me, but that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. One I just like, oh, sorry. Oh, Lillian, please. I, I want to um, throw it over to Lillian because I know you have something, something to say about it, so please. Yeah, just going back to the topic of social media. Um, I know that like a lot of the blame is like, you both put a lot of the blame on social media. And while I would really like to blame social media, because I personally hate technology and I am just waiting for the worldwide EMP to come any day now. Um, I don't think that it's social media is really at fault. Uh, it, it for sure has made people more fervent about their radical beliefs on either side, but this suppression of freedom of expression has been going on for ages. I, I remember a couple summers ago, I picked up some vintage books uh, 
about uh, this topic. And I was reading this one book, it was from the 70s. And the people back then who were uh, against freedom of expression, it was actually the right. It was, it was the Christian right clutching their pearls, saying that uh, people were talking blasphemy and it was just like hypersexualization. Uh, like these stories were on, on pure and, and things like that. And I think that we've always had people trying to suppress our freedom of expression. And it just, it just changes. It changes generation to generation, depending on who has power. Now the left has a lot more power culturally. They've totally won the culture war. So they're trying to suppress the freedom of expression of the right wing because they want to hold their power, whether they're doing that uh, consciously or not. And, and back then the right had power and they were trying to uh, suppress the left wing degenerates from uh, encroaching on their space. I, I do think that our freedom of expression is more in danger now because I think that this moral high ground that the social justice warriors have does bolster their position a lot more because it's, it's hard to argue against like, oh, you're, you're hurting these, uh, these, these oppressed uh, marginalized groups. But uh, I think to say that like social media has uh, birthed this uh, whole debate around freedom of expression is uh, a little bit, it, it, it's, it is again, like ignoring history because um, people Actually, have always yeah. been told to say. No, you're totally right. Absolutely, no question. But I think yeah. this cancel culture, that's that's new, right? I mean, people, yes, they objected, like you were just pointing out, but this cancel culture where people feel entitled to they don't agree with you and therefore you get you know deleted off or your posts get deleted on facebook or by these fact checkers who the heck are these fact checkers anyway do they have any credentials do we know <laughs> you know so the cancel culture i find really has reached a whole new level that i've not been familiar with in the past uh, and I'll give you an example. So I had posted whatever, something about the American election because I spent quite a few years in the US where I had my children and raised my children. Um, and so it was something about the US election. And then a young man reached out to me who's related, but I, <laughs> I'm not gonna say any more than that. And he says, well, I totally don't agree with what you stated there and, and I want you to remove that. And I went, what you want to cancel what i just wrote here it's none of your business like how dare you <laughs> but he's free to, he's free to tell you that and you're free to oh, disagree with <laughs> of course of course but if he had had the opportunity to cancel me out he would have because he didn't agree with my um with my um thoughts on how the election went which it floored me it floored me well great transition I have to say from freedom of yeah. speech to consensus, that was amazing. <laughs> that is a true politician idea. But uh, the, I think the issue there is when you look at cancel culture, it's back to the millennial topic, back to uh, the part of social media. Not that social media creates any of this. It just, like everything else that social media does, it makes it bigger because it gets to other people quicker. That's all that social media does. It gets things to people quicker than usual. But what cancel culture has related to this is it makes it easier for people to avoid the problems they don't want to talk about. I don't like, for say, I don't like Donald Trump, let's just say that. It's easier for me to have him removed from my timeline, have him removed from office, have him removed from this and that, than it is for me to confront the issues that I don't like about him. Because I'm scared that I either might be proven wrong, embarrass myself, or that I'll just get angry and make a fool of myself. It's easier to avoid it than to confront it. Just like a fight, it's easier to get someone put in jail than to knock them out. I think it's as simply as put as that. Yeah, but I find it puzzling talking about, about Trump and I'm certainly not a Trump fan and you know, just because of his personality alone, that's for sure. Uh, but the fact that, that the social media platforms have the ability to cancel out the president of the United States, it's just shocking, isn't it? Yeah, I, that's like a whole nother can of worms. I definitely think that the social media companies have too much power. Because like social media 
like whether we like it or not, it's integral to most people's lives now. Like if you want to be successful in the business world, you need to have a Facebook account, you need to have LinkedIn, like you need to be constantly connecting with people online. Um, and going going back to the charter, people, we have a right to uh, pursue a livelihood in every province of the country, but just pursuing a livelihood. If you're banned off of all social media, that greatly restricts your ability to pursue a livelihood. I don't know what the solution to this is. Part of me wants to say that like big tech and like social media should be nationalized um, so that the charter would apply or that so that it wouldn't be up to these big corporations to police people's speech. Um, but I don't know, there could be, there are problems that could go along with that as well. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think that like Zuckerberg should be in charge of uh, what people say on the biggest platforms in the world. No, of course not. And like Carla pointed out, if you don't want to listen to whatever someone says, well, you unfollow them. Problem solved, right? Simple as well, that. I don't know, like before social media, like if you don't like a politician, like, oh, I don't like Pierre Trudeau. And like, I just, oh, he comes on CBC, I turn off my TV. Like, I, I don't buy his just watch me book. Like, people have always been ignoring things that they don't like. Um, no, but I don't know. But now people are trying to say that you can't say things that you, they don't like. And that's that's the problem. It's not that they're creating bubbles for themselves because, like, everybody has always been in a bubble to some extent. I think I articulated myself pretty poorly because my point was, yes, exactly what you guys said. It's, it's easier to avoid people. But I think cancel culture itself is the highest version of avoiding people. Because let's put, for example, me and Lillian, we're university students. She says something about you, Vic, that really pissed me off because she goes to UBC, I'm correct, right? Just a party school. You guys don't even study. <laughs> In first year, that is true. She's not wrong. But, <laughs> but uh, she said that. And because she said that, I felt she destroyed the core values of you, Vic. Therefore, she should be kicked out of UBC and any Canadian school. That just made it easier for me to avoid her or avoid asking her why she thought that. Because maybe she is right, but I don't want to hear that. I'm right. Let's get her out of the. Let's get her out of the way. I mean, we can do a whole podcast on that. <laughs> but my, my that's my general point. Well, Cancel culture is the highest version of avoiding people. Yeah, and, and not just avoid, but it, and to punish too. Okay. Yes, and punish. exactly. Out of bitterness which is the sad thing. It's, it's mostly bitterness, jealousy, all these normal human traits we see are just being put into that position. A guy who has a different view than me is in a higher position of office that I feel I deserve, therefore I want to destroy him. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's exactly where this Bill C-36 comes in. If an anonymous person can now accuse someone else of hate speech without a real definition of what that possibly even means, I mean, you're opening up a huge potential flood of people accusing others. Also, if there's like financial payback or something, possibly for the accuser. I mean, this is just, this is such a slippery slope that I even feel if that bill were to be passed and become law, this country has turned into a dictatorship because how do you protect yourself? And you just made the point, well, Cal, you said, oh, well, I really have an issue that she, you know, called you Vic a party school, blah, 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 blah. And, and she hates me or, you know, some, some, you can make up whatever you want, obviously, not even based on facts. That's a real problem. A real problem. Bill C-36, like, people were saying the same thing. I think it was Bill C-17, if I'm, I, I might be wrong, but it was a few years ago, and Jordan Peterson was, like, very vocal about this, about uh, the bill saying that if you misgendered a trans person, you could potentially go to jail, and everyone was all up in arms about this, and, like, I disagree with that bill, and I disagree with Bill uh, C-36, of course, but I think the, the possibility of people actually being prosecuted under these laws pretty low. Um, like, it's just like somebody anonymous can accuse you. Like, you still are innocent until proven guilty. Like the burden of proof is still on, it, it's still on the people prosecuting you. Like, I don't- well, except, except I'm not sure you're right about that. And I was, earlier I was sort of 
you know, trying to get through the actual Bill C-36, but oh my gosh, if you're not an attorney, how the heck are you even going to decipher what exactly they're talking about? But from what I have heard is that they would want to um, protect the identity of the anonymous accuser. And hence, there would be no court of law, there would be no discovery, there would be no due process. So guilty, period. Well, the person accusing you, like they would accuse you if, if I wrote something on online and somebody accused me of saying hate speech, even if that person wasn't named, like the thing that I said would still be out there and that would still be up for debate, whether that, whether that fell under hate speech. So yeah, but I it goes that, even yeah, but it, it goes even further that the person can just say that they're afraid of you. So I did not find that in that bill that it has to be something actual that you said. So this is very, very, very gray in a dangerous direction, in my opinion. I don't know. Like it is, I agree, it's terrible. It should not pass, and it it is worrying, but I just don't think that this bill will be that strong in its application just based on how vague the wording is and the whole anonymous accusations. Like, I, I think that it's just kind of like Justin Trudeau trying to appease people wanting him to fight against online hate. And I don't, I don't think it'll be implemented very often. It's the Trudeau tradition. He, tr he tries to make something that looks like it's doing something, but really doesn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. I think it's another case of that. <laughs> I hope you're right. Like he'll pass, he'll pass this bill, but then he'll be uh, skiing into Fino. <laughs> <laughs> we did talk a bit about at the beginning, sort of leaving some of these laws open for interpretation and open to subjectivity, right? So I think for me, just as an individual Canadian, the little I know about Bill C-36, what concerns me about something like this is that in different hands or in the wrong hands, somebody could take this to a point where you could be put in jail or fined you know, $5,000 because you wrote something on Twitter that upset somebody. That's, that's it, it. I mean, again, it sounds ludicrous, but I mean, these, are crazy, these are crazy times that we're living in. So, all right. So uh, you guys, we've been an hour already. I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I just want to, I just want to the cancel culture. We didn't dig into that enough. I just want to get a couple of your points on cancel culture. Some of your highlights to, you know, whether like it's a low light, but you know, for instance, like Dave Chappelle being called out, potentially here and sort of actually flipping that around and you know some of the um, celebrities that we've seen canceled uh, and then come back because you know like Johnny Depp you know because the, the accuser uh, apparently was it was incorrect or infactual so how do we feel about abuse him yeah how do we feel about cancel culture and I just there's one one term I found very helpful and it was written it was in that uh, Harper's letter that was um, not Stephen Harper, but Harper, the uh, the magazine, the one Harper's was, Bazaar. Harper's Bazaar. Thank you. The one that was penned and signed off on by a, a host of authors, including Margaret Atwood and others. And there was a term in there which I really liked. It's ideological conformity. And there seems to be this push. We talked about, you know, uh, the thought police, ideological conformity. So cancel culture, ideological conformity. How do we feel about that? And what are some of your perspectives on that? Um, I'll pick up with. I, I don't want to play a victim card in any situation, but I think it's important to understand that um, as a victim of things that you could have said were cancelable. For example, when I was in high school, I got into a serious altercation one time where a younger student, a year younger than me, was racially abusing one of my cousins who was also in his grade. It got very intense, very verbal, and I admit it got physical. And it was, it was like the talk of the school, you know, when something happens that big, everyone hears about it. And the principal called me in and in my head, I thought, damn, like I am screwed. But it ended up actually pretty well for me. Like he apologized that these racial things happened within his school uh, and all these things. He's like, we're gonna punish this kid to the maximum, yada, yada, yada. And inside me for a second, it felt good hearing that, that he was gonna get canceled. But then I thought about it. If I just let him, get expelled, for example. What is that going to do to help me or him? He's going to hate me. I will forever hate him. And if that was the case, he'll never learn. And no one will truly understand what happened. Instead, 
I, I believe he did need to be suspended. So I'm glad the principal eventually did that. He was suspended for, for only a few days. But what I made sure happened was we had a discussion. I was not mad that he did the things he did. I was mad that he did the things he did without knowing what he was saying, how, like knowing the impact of what he was saying. Once we talked about the fact that the words he used, the things he said were hurtful and why they were hurtful, the kid almost broke down in tears because he didn't like he literally thought calling my cousin the n-word was the equivalent of calling him a scaredy cat or something like that you know something stupid it's cancel culture avoids the conversation that is necessary to have which is the whole point of like reconciliation for example like you mentioned uh, trudeau and tofino if imagine if every indigenous person wanted no white people in power in office Imagine what kind of war there would be there, like politically. It's not about that. It's about mistakes happen. People make serious issues in their life. We need to talk to acknowledge why that was wrong. If there is penalties to be paid in the legal sense, like, you know, if someone commits a crime, they need to go to jail, whatever. But the overall outcome should be people understanding why the things happened were wrong, how we can move forward from them, or if they weren't wrong, why we need to allow ourselves to be a little more loose and less sensitive as a society. Well said. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Caleb. And I, I think that's a great story to, to demonstrate uh, the alternatives to cancel culture, because I, I think it does eliminate people's ability to learn and grow. Um, but I think at this point, like cancel culture has kind of destroyed itself, like yeah. almost everybody's been canceled at least once. Um, and you know what they say, like, if we're all canceled, no one is. Mm -hmm. um so I think like everyone just needs to kind of stop stop caring just become uncancelable become uncancelable a lot of the times if you apologize for something that you've said um even if like in in your case Caleb like that guy was obviously wrong but if you said something that you believe is true and people just didn't like what you said if you apologize then you're just you're just conceding that territory I think a good example of this is uh, Doja Cat. She, people tried to cancel her because she was in some like edgy group chats and she made like some jokes like about black people and herself being black. And she didn't apologize. She was just like, yeah, those are my friends. Like we were just joking around. I thought it was funny. And people kind of just like went on listening to her music and liking Doja Cat. I, I think that that's a good kind of way to recover from things we just need to stop making such a big deal about it and uh i know a lot of people need social media for their work and school and things but if you don't have social media like you can't be canceled like it, it's a pretty this reality is disappointing that we can't that the cancel culture is so rampant but just just delete all your social media like it's th that's the solution right there that's that's what i have to say i hate to say it and please don't get me canceled for this, but <laughs> I think the man who we can credit cancel culture being defeated by is Donald Trump. Why? He, he was running in an election where he might have had maybe a hundred things that were cancelable about him. And just because he said F you or I don't care or let's just forget about it and never admitted defeat, he was never removed. Your supporters never went anywhere. It's the opposition that's trying to cancel you always. In, in life in general. It, usually it's just the people who wanted you down trying to elevate that situation. So it's, it's really ourselves canceling ourselves. Yeah, I think his supporters liked him better for that irreverent attitude too. Uh, not that I agreed with a lot of things he did or most of the things he did, but I can admire his strength in that sense. I can actually share a, a quick story as well about how important conversation is. Um, so about this controversial issue, which we already discussed from um, my uh, my campaign, I received this, this email and it wasn't hateful. <laughs> the hateful ones I just hit delete. It wasn't hateful. It was thought provoking. But really her message to me was, you know what, get out of politics and don't ever run again kind of thing, right? <laughs> But somehow it struck me as, as someone that I wanted to respond to. So I wrote her a nice email back and I told her exactly where I was coming from. 
And we have since become, she's in Australia, she's Canadian, and we have since exchanged probably 20 heartfelt emails. And we're now, <laughs> which is so fascinating, I'm actually 100% on the side of the Indigenous people, right? So people just didn't understand that. And I sponsored a, um, a Sioux Indian child in South Dakota a number of years ago, and she was in grade three. And, uh, you know, I became her personal sponsor. I never met, we never met in person, but I tried to inspire her with, with books and, and I, you know, send her school things, school supplies that she needed and art supplies and those kinds of things. But because I took the time to really find age appropriate reading materials for her, her grandmother, she was living with her grandmother, her dad was dead and her, her mother was in prison. So it was, you know, a difficult situation. But because of my, my um, the things that I send, her grandmother and, and my question, how is she reading? How is she getting on with, with these books? Uh, her grandmother had her tested and it turned out she was reading at a grade one level. So because I asked, she then was put into extra reading help to help her get up to her, her level. So going back to which helped her a lot, right? I mean, that's so important. Education is so important because it empowers children and, and opens up a world to a brighter future down the road. Um, but anyway, fast forward to my new friend in Australia, we're now in discussion, how can we possibly set up some, something like that here in Canada? I don't know if it exists, but I'm, I'm researching to see maybe we can set up a sponsorship program for especially those children that are in particular risk because they don't have a support network at home or, or something like that. So something really positive has come out of her initial letter and her and my willingness to engage in a conversation. So I'm really excited about that. And her last email ended with hugs and then her name. So, well, I and that like wouldn't have been possible if uh, she had engaged in cancel culture. Is that what you're yeah. getting at? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, or if I would have engaged in cancel culture and canceled, you know, out her her comment to me. So, you know, yes, we need to engage in conversation, even if it's difficult. And of course, at the end of the day, if we can't find any common ground, we can always be adult enough and agree to disagree. But we need to stop cancel culture. And I really encourage everybody and my kids as well, that if somebody says something to you don't you don't agree with, talk to them. Try to understand where you're coming from, you know, or, or what you just heard, said hurts me, right? It hurts me. And, and you made that point, Caleb, that, that people often don't understand how hurtful certain comments, even small words, can be. So, um, I yeah. think that even with, with you and me right here, I'm not trying to cancel you out, Liliana, just, just something Thanks. that... Uh, said something that something you said um like remember when we were talking about the whole vaccine passport controversy and we still don't agree but we agree to disagree and we we, I, we hear each other out and I'm not gonna lie the first time I heard that I thought like because it was I didn't hear your words or I didn't hear what you said I heard what people said about you I thought you know, oh this racist lady this oh. crazy racist lady that's what I was thinking about you if I'm being honest but now listening to you I almost feel embarrassed thinking that way. I don't think you're a racist at all. I don't think that you don't like indigenous people at all. I realize that you do care for them. I just think tactically, strategically, and verbally, we disagree on the way to approach some of those situations, which is okay. I will never agree with everyone on everything, but I wish, I wish everyone could hear you because I don't think everyone would agree with you, but at least everyone would understand you. Right, right. And of course, you know, and I'm not making making any excuses, but I am German and Germans are very blunt <laughs> by nature. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you're right. You're right. So thank you. Appreciate that. Well, that's a very positive note to end on. And Caleb, thank you for being honest. And everybody here, Lillian, your honesty, Renata, this honesty and frankness and openness and great discussion. So for our benefit and for the benefit of anyone watching, and uh, yeah, I look forward to perhaps some future conversations. Thanks for hosting. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, nice to meet everybody.